Matteo. <laughs> we <laughs> finally meet. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, people have a ton of questions for you. I mean, seriously, they, they have... Um, uh, I just had to adjust my camera so all my gorgeousness gets in, <laughs> into, into, the, <laughs> into the screen. Uh, when you first appeared on the scene, uh, which is, I guess, the scene of YouTube and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. They saw this young... Yeah, and they, and they saw this young guy playing really well. But the thing that really stood out is how you were playing. But I don't want to talk about the guitar. I don't want to, like, go head first into the guitar nerdy stuff just yet. But I want to ask you this. When you look back at the video of you playing the chicken... What is what are your thoughts now looking back to that? Because that's the video that we kind of one of the videos that we kind of first got to know yeah. you from. Yeah, first of all, maybe it was too fast. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I think maybe looking back to the, that video in particular, uh, I think uh, of course it made me very happy because it was a. Uh, uh, very wonderful section with uh, uh, with Ricardo and Salvatore. Ricardo is the bass player, Ricardo Liva, and Salvatore mm. Lima is the, the drummer. Uh, so yeah, th that period was really fun and we were, we actually recorded a lot of other standards, fusion standards, but we actually published the, uh, just a few of them, like the best ones. Um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe that version of the chicken was really too fast. <laughs> if I have to replay it now, maybe a little bit slower <laughs> would be better. But of course, we were young and uh, we were hungry for, uh, you know, <laughs> power and uh, speed. <laughs> I think you. I think you. Have, I think you attained that <laughs> mission accomplished, right? Um, so. This uh, okay, so this is four years ago now, right? Or is it five years ago? Uh, it, it was uh, almost four years ago. It was uh, in uh, twenty seventeen, I think. Yeah, twenty April twenty seventeen. Yeah. The, well, now that you're so old, <laughs> yeah, now that you're just so much older, um, you are. I'm guess. Uh, well, actually, I don't know this. Did you go to music school? And if you yeah, did, yeah. where does that fit in? Was that the four years since then that you were in music school? Yeah, actually, uh, I got to... Uh, it's called uh, Liceo Musicale in Palermo. It's actually... A, uh, uh, I don't remember the name in English. Um, uh, not the college, but the previous, uh, previous school. Oh. The, the school before college. Uh, I don't remember the name. High school. Yeah. That's what they would call it in the States, like high school or secondary school or... Yeah, so it was basically a musical high school, but I only studied classical guitar there. I studied for five years, but I wasn't actually a good student because uh, <laughs> I wasn't that much into the classical guitar repertoire, you know. But of course it helped me a lot to achieve some control with the instrument and uh, I actually took up a few concepts from the classical guitar and uh, of course I applied them to the to the electric one uh, yeah so yeah that was a really useful study uh, but of course I'm I don't consider myself a classical player I I consider myself a 100% electric player and then I moved to uh, the conservatory uh, always in Palermo, and I currently studying uh, jazz guitar at the Palermo Conservatory. Uh, so you're still in school. At, at what at what year are you? Yeah, so we have uh, three years. I am currently attending the jazz guitar course, and uh, I am at the last one, so the third year of jazz guitar. Wow! And they have they have loads of old guys there like you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the level is, is pretty high, you know, there are some yes. pre pretty good players, I think. One of the things that I learned here in Miami, that, and I think that this also might um, work in Italian, is that when 
somebody who is um, Hispanic or Italian says pretty good, they're talking about very good. Oh. <laughs> pretty good means, pretty good means very, very good, right? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, I used to have yeah. students come, come to me and, and um, they would ask me why I gave them a C on their assignment. And I said, because you did pretty good. And they're like, well, pretty good should be an A, right? And I was like, no, it's a C. So that's when I learned that pretty good actually means very, very good. So you're, so you're in an environment that has a lot of great players. Yeah, there, there are a lot of great players from Sicily, especially. Um, I think I, I can name a few if you want. Please do, please do. Yeah, there is a, um, there is a player from, that I know from, from a while. It's, it's a little bit older than me. Uh, it's called Francesco Buzzurro. Uh, it's a, basically, he plays Godin guitars. He's a cla classical player. But with a heavy jazz background, so he can also play standards. He plays standards a lot, and he make his own arrangements. And uh, I, I think he's one of the best one here. Uh, so it's really, really, really good. You should check him out. I will. I will. Um, there are uh, other players that I like, maybe on, on the more traditional jazz scene. Uh, do you know about mm -hmm. Pasquale Grasso? Of course, yes. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Really, really, really good players. Uh, of course, he's heavy on the um, traditional side, so it's you know Charlie Parker and the hard bop era, uh, mm -hmm. and of course a lot of Bud Powell inspired ideas. So it sounds like a piano player <laughs> sometimes. No, yeah, and he's uh, really, really good. Um, of course, there, there are a lot, lot of players that I like, not only in Italy, but there are really a lot of good players that I, that I like. Well, let's talk about Italy for a moment, because, um, and not only, not only Italians, but Italian-Americans, Italian-Argentinians, um, there, uh, there is an incredible connection to the guitar, and when people were saying, oh, guitar is dead and, you know, uh, you know, meaning like pop music and that kind of thing. Guitar never died in Italy. It never died in Argentina. And so I, I'm, I'm at least that's that's what I've seen as an outsider. Mm -hmm. There always seem to be so many great Italian players and great uh, Italian Argentinian players. What do you think the connection is with Italians and the guitar? Um, I don't really know. I think it's a mystery why we have a lot of good players. Uh, I think sometimes uh, uh, because, you know, Italians always struggle to work sometimes. So, especially on the music scene, because I think there's not really much interest here for instrumental music in general. So for Mm -hmm. The jazz fusion scene in Italy is not that good, uh, commercially speaking, you know. Uh, so I think uh, we have to come up with uh, uh, a lot of new ways to work. So that's why I think sometimes uh, it, Italian players in general, not only guitar players, uh, I see them like uh, uh, more uh, versatile in some areas because we have to try to work everywhere and survive, you know? So you have to uh, absorb, you need to absorb a, a lot of styles. And I, I think that it's the same with Argentinian players. And they really have, really have a, you know, a very personal timing, um, especially I think also the Brazilian ones, yes. Uh, yes. they have like a really, really good timing uh, and you you can hear that they are from uh, from that area, you know, from the South American area, uh, just because of their timing. And uh, one player that I that I remember I, I like a lot is uh, Andre Nieri, for example. Oh yeah. He also yes. uses yes. a um, really good finger style technique mixed with a pick, uh, like sort of hybrid picking stuff, and he's mm. really really good also technically speaking. And uh, he has also an incredible sense of timing. 
Yes, and an, uh, another a Brazilian Italian. I sorry, Brazilians, Brazilian Italians. I left you out, but there is a, a lot of them. And I, yeah. I like my impression was that if you take a guitar out in a party in in Italy, people aren't gonna. It's it, people are like guitarists are are kind of respected. Uh, yeah, I think. Maybe, yes, but of course, if you grab the guitar and play, I don't know, a tribal tech tune, nobody, oh, yeah. nobody's gonna dance, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, guitar is always one of the most popular instruments, so I think uh, if you grab the guitar at a party, of course, uh, you will be successful anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know what, I think, I think we should just face dive right into the nerd section of this interview. Yeah. There are a lot of students who started with their mothers or fathers or grandfathers nylon string, took a few lessons with the local classical guy, decided to move on because they didn't like classical music. And the first thing that their new teacher, their rock guitar teacher told them is you can't play like this. You need to get a pick. Yeah. You have obviously, you know, blown that so far out of the water that I think that there's, um, people need to know about how you do what you do because it really does open up a whole new thing. And, um, and it's, uh, it's obviously not new to you, but I think for people who, um, who see you play, they're thinking like, how, how do I even do that? So I have, a, I have some questions that I think are going to help clear up, um, you know, via your answers. They're going to help clear up some of the mystery for people. Yeah. So first, let's start with the aesthetic part of it. And obviously to play rest stroke, um, you need a certain gauge string, maybe. I happen to use seriously light strings and I play with a thumb pick in my fingers, but I'm imagining that you need a certain gauge string. So what gauge strings do you use? Um, so I basically use uh, two guitars now. This is the, the custom Repstar and here I use uh, tens. So I use mm. it for distortion stuff and typing stuff. You know, I, I normally use tens because nines are too thin, I think for me. Um, I think these are the Dario, but just because mm. I, the the first uh, uh, string you found is the Dario, so I I don't use them uh, for a certain uh, uh, reason, just okay. because they are easy to find, you know. Right, right. Um, and this is the seven twenty B, and these are actually Thomas Tick twelves, and. Mm. This one I use it for jazz stuff, mainly clean. And he actually has a slightly um, uh, less powered pickups than the, the custom one, so I think it's really good for clean stuff. And aesthetically, it's also really nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very pleasing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I basically use a dance most of the time. And, and and what is your experience when you do use a lighter string? It's just I don't know. It it sounds also um, the sound. I, I think tens are the right uh, right amount of uh, hardness on on the string. You know, so I can do proper bendings uh, because the. The main issue is uh, the intonation. So if I get the intonation right with my bending, uh, I, I'm sure that there are good strings, you know? Uh, it's very interesting that the first thing that you're talking about is your left hand when everybody's thinking that you're gonna be talking about the resistance that it's gonna be giving your rest stroke. Yeah, I, I don't think this is not too important, I think. Of course, if the string is too thin, it mm -hmm. would be harder for me. So that's why I also prefer tens over nine, because I find, my, I find myself more comfortable with bigger strings. Of and there must be some, there must be some kind of um, 
resistance and also spring that you're getting from having a little bit more mass, you know, a little bit heavier or harder of a string. Yeah. Um, is what I'm guessing because I, I mean, imagine just that even just one stroke, if you were using eights like myself, uh, mm -hmm. um, that it would just be like, yeah, the be strings moves there. too quickly, so it's harder to achieve control, at least for me. Um, no, I, I would imagine that fake nails is not, it's not really important when you're playing electric. Uh, use... It's important if you don't have uh, uh, good nails, you know. I yeah. likely have uh, very strong nails, so I don't have this kind of problem, so I always use natural nails. And can you talk about your transition from classical to electric and just generally applying, you know, in generally, uh, wait, in general, yeah. <laughs> um, applying, I'm, I'm still, I'm still learning English. Um, in, in general, <laughs> how, do, how you applied your knowledge, and then I have some specific questions, but just the transition to, to using rest stroke and thinking, hey, may, maybe I can use it on electric guitar. What was that yeah. like? Yeah, first of all, I should say that I, I first started with the electric guitar, not classical. Uh, okay. So, uh, and of course, uh, <laughs> this is a funny one. Uh, I also say that in, uh, in other interviews, I, when I first started, I didn't know that you should use the pick with the electric guitar. So that's why oh. I started with fingers, because I, I also right. saw my father playing with fingers. So I, I just thought every every kind of guitar should be played with fingers, you know. Uh, later on, of course, I discovered uh, uh, this one, <laughs> but I never use it. I, I, I can't use the pick still now. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's a really strange thing. <laughs> um, I think I, I started with the rest stroke technique. The rest stroke is when you hold your, your finger to the next string. So, yes. so you basically have more power. Uh, um, and of course a lot of volume and with classical guitar I perfectioned uh, the the other um, uh, the other way of playing uh, so this is like the first free stroke technique uh, so for example I, I mainly use the, these two positions for uh, for the electric guitar I don't know if you can see it um, almost. So yeah. this is the rest stroke technique. So I, this a, uh, this is a more like a, a bass technique, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the free stroke technique. It's more like a classical approach. So I okay. mainly use uh, this approach for uh, you know chromatic ideas or like uh, three note per string scales. So okay, I restart. Okay. Um, yeah. So I. Oh wait. We should. We should do the clap then. Yeah. One, two, three. Okay. Um. So yeah, I was talking about my father. Um. Yeah, my father is also a guitar player, but it, it wasn't uh, a teacher for me. It was more uh, like a listening guy. Um. So it introduced me to a lot of new jazz players because my father is also a, um, loves jazz, he's a jazz guy. Um, so back when I started, uh, he always told me, yeah, you, you should listen to Wes Montgomery, you should listen to Django yeah. and uh, of course other cats. And so that's why I started with jazz very early. I was, uh, I, I was a, basically a rock blues guy back when I started mm -hmm. uh, so I loved uh, you know the purple Led Zeppelin Jimi Hendrix uh, I, I started with the, the rock blues uh, 60s 70s era yeah. um, then I moved uh, more to the traditional jazz side I started to, to study a lot to, to a lot of West Montgomery tunes uh, no, when you st when you went to the the jazz side of things, it wasn't it wasn't a foreign language to you at that point. It was something that you had heard from way back, right? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the the listening process helped me a lot to achieve, you know, 
uh, the the basic uh, uh, vocabulary that you need to have in order to play jazz. Uh, but of course, I I don't consider myself a, a jazz player because I'm I'm not a pure jazz guy. Right. And uh, if I play too much standards and uh, if I play too much in on a you know with clean sound. Sometimes I begin to start missing the the power of the distortion, you know, and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, and of yeah. course the overall bending. Uh... Of course, uh... you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that that's why I I think I consider myself a fusion player. I like the power of rock and the and the colors and the elegance uh, of jazz. Now, to go back to what you were talking about with the right hand, you, um, what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that you have, um, you have your own method. You've categorized, you know, when you have chromatic lines, you're doing rest stroke. When you're doing the arpeggio stuff, you switch to free stroke. And I've noticed that. And um, uh, I noticed that from free stroke, you'll also do muting. Yeah, sometimes, yes. Because, the, the, um, yeah, the free stroke, uh, because when I play the rest stroke, the, the palm is here, so I can't use it right. for, for the palm muting. When I play like this, I can use some palm muting. I, I never mm -hmm. use it too much, but of course... Right, I, right. I noticed that it's very sparse. And which leads me, since we're talking about muting, um, the groove strap is, is you know, the, the dampener. Uh, uh, is yes. that a groove strap? Yeah, it's a, uh, I think it's called the groove gear fret wrap or something. Oh, so. yeah, groove gear, groove gear. Yeah. Um, there are some people who say, well, if you have to use a dampener, that's cheating. But, I mean, uh, the guitar is hard enough as it is, and it's a tool. Do you ever find that that gets in the way, or not really? Yeah, some, sometimes it gets in the way if you need to play, uh, like for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, these strings, and then you, you, need, you need to play on like on higher frets. Yeah. That can sometimes get in the way if you, uh, if you need to play chords here. Um, but of course I, Mm, I mainly use it for, you know, tapping runs and only if I'm playing with uh, a lot of distortion, you know. But when I'm playing clean, for example, mm, yeah, I can also leave it here, so it doesn't get in the way. Right, I noticed with the Brent Mason transcriptions, you aren't using it at all? No, because uh, I have to play a lot of uh, things here. So I have to play. In your opinion, um, using the groove gear um, um, dampener, <laughs> using yeah. the using the groove gear dampener is you you see that purely as a tool. It's not a big deal, and people who are interested in playing with rest stroke should feel that they it's not a big deal, right? Using it. Yeah, if you if you feel the need of of using it, of, of course you can use it. I, I don't consider that cheating, of course, because uh, in order to play clean, you need, of course, you don't play uh, better with this thing on. You right. ju you just have a, a slightly less uh, background noise. Th that's it. So I I think uh, I see it uh, just uh, as a recording tool, you know. And if a beginner was coming to you and saying, Matteo, I want to learn, I want to learn exactly how you do stuff, would you say, okay, well, get yourself a dampener and let's start? Yeah, it should be a good idea, I think. Okay. Now, for those people who are interested in, let's say they don't have, they don't have access to you as a teacher, of course, are you actually... Uh, let me let's slow down, okay, and slow down. Can people contact you for lessons? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm not a teacher, and uh, oh my I'm god, myself a teacher. Uh, so uh, 
I, I think before teaching people, I have to, <laughs> you know, teach myself how to explain uh, the way I play because I, I'm a, basically I self-taught uh, everything I uh, everything I know, and for that reason I don't know if the my approach is the better choice for you uh, because just because it's very personal, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, I don't consider myself the, the best option for a teacher. Maybe in the future I will start to teach, but um, I don't feel like uh, it's something that I will uh, uh, do uh, in, in this period. Well, that's actually, you know, I laughed because I thought that there is a, there, there have been so many times where I, I want to say that same answer, although <laughs> I went... <laughs> many times but i love teaching and actually it's something i've dedicated my life to so it just hearing that that answer was uh it was very <laughs> pleasing it was very pleasing i found a lot i found there was something in there that was um yes very admirable but um you did also bring up that which is i didn't expect to talk about this but to become a teacher um especially what something i i've seen during covid is now everyone's a teacher and out of necessity i understand that people aren't gigging so what is the next thing that you do well that you have the skill well let me teach it and yeah i'm sure there are some naturally talented teachers i'm i'm sure of it, it simultaneously i think that there is there is something to dedicating your life to being able to convey information in a way that's that that reaches people and actually i think you might be one of those people i think uh, you might be i think you might be um a natural teacher because there is somebody out there who's who really idolizes you that person is nameless i mean you do have a, a lot of followers and a lot of people who just really adore your playing and just by virtue of seeing the difference between this and this might have caused a huge light bulb and a light bulb moment as they say like um uh just being able to see that one detail you've obviously codified it for yourself yeah what you do and how you're doing it and that actually just that simple thing could change somebody's life and i'm, I'm sure that there's a lot more to what you're doing than just obviously this or this and you can explain it so i think and you have a good way about you so i think that you you might be one of those guys who's a natural teacher um it's something yeah, to consider I, I, i'm not trying to like i'm not trying to pull you in to this profession yeah, yeah <laughs> you know? I, know. I i will but, do it for sure in the future because uh, i want to share what i learned of course but i want to share it uh, in, in the best way possible. So I, I don't feel that I'm prepared enough to teach right now. Mm. Uh, because of course, I, I consider myself more uh, of an artist of, and a performer rather than a yes. teacher. So uh, yeah, let, let do the teaching to the professional teachers. And, I and there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off. Um, when I've taught a lot, I'm thinking, oh my God, I need to, I need to practice there. And, and then you find like, I'm doing all these teaching responsibilities. I'm saying I meaning anybody, anybody who's decided to teach at a serious level. And then a lot of times your skill level goes down. Um, you know, in your brain, you're thinking I can do that. And then you pick up your guitar and you're like, oh my God, it's been a week since I've played, which leads me to how often are you practicing not enough uh -uh. <laughs> and i'm a very lazy guy so i only practice if i have some gigs if i have some live sessions if i have to record something otherwise i just not play and uh, that's really a, a strange thing for for other people because they sometimes think i play like eight hours a day every day but that's not my case. I play like uh, two hours, maybe three. Of course, every day. I I, I, nev 
I rarely skip days because, of course, I like playing guitar, but I don't like to study. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I'm more on the lazy side, but of course, I, I'm also a, a perfectionist. So if I want to, to learn something, I always learn it uh, on a really deep level. I, I always, I sometimes stay on the same subject or on the same uh, argument. Um, and I, I, I want to figure out things of my, of my own, you know, I don't want to go to YouTube lessons or some, some stuff. And I think that that's the best way to, um, you know, learn things because if you figure it out alone, uh, you have a more deep understanding of the whole thing. So, yeah, I, I don't have a practice routine. I just grab the guitar and play what I like in that moment. So you obviously have spent a lot of time, though, figuring out, let's say, okay, so there's the, there's the rest stroke and the free stroke, but also your legato playing, the tapping. That, that didn't just happen by accident. So I'm imagining that, let's say, when you're working out a tapping thing, just, just the technique of being able to tap, there are no Instagram, uh, uh, Facebook, um, telephone ringing. Like you, I'm, I'm guessing you shut all that out for those two hours and you're incredibly focused on hunt. Yeah, you, you need to shut down also this one because it's, an incredible distraction <laughs> and of course when I w when I want to learn something for example I learned a lot of typing stuff from Guthrie Govan mm -hmm. and I, I remember when I learned fives that um, I remember that when I learned this leak and it was uh, this one and it was a pickup section and I just took out this kind of four and uh, I try to figure out how to do it uh, like in other keys, for example, or uh, uh, play it uh, on the different chords, you know. So mm -hmm. I always try to extrapolate the idea, not only the leak. Um, so like, for example, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Alan Osworth, but I, I can't uh, do Alan Osworth solos. I never learned uh, an, Alan, an Alan Osworth solo. Yeah. Uh, because I don't want to sound like him. I want to just extrapolate a few things that I like and, uh, of course, uh, make it uh, my own uh, personal ideas. Uh, so, like, uh, for example, this leak here, I don't know. Oh, lift your guitar up just a wee bit. Yeah. Like, for example, this, stuff, this wide interval, Wide intervals, uh, pentatonic ideas. Uh, maybe all Allsworth never played this one, but it's inspired from him, not just yes. copied from him. Uh, and I think that's the point. You need to be inspired by other players. You don't need to copy them. Yes, and also the Alan Holdsworth lines. If you do play an Alan Holdsworth line, it's like after you've played that line for the listener, I mean, actually for the player and the listener, you know, like if that's all you can do, you can't, the rest of your solo isn't going to be at that kind of improvisational um, st statistical density. Yeah, it's, it's going to be totally like, brrr. so all the listeners are like, oh yeah, that's the Holdsworth lick, huh. you know, and uh it's it's so it's super obvious where I I totally agree with you when you um, kind of extract the vibe, the quality of your lines after you play that one big Holdsworth lick is usually like a couple gears lower, and everybody who's listening, you know, especially if you're playing that kind of music, um, they're like, oh yeah, I just heard that Holdsworth lick. Mm -hmm, good job. You know, let's hear the rest yeah. of your actual solo. Yeah. So, um, but, but I know what you mean. And, um, you know, actually, this would be a good time to talk about that aesthetic because I tried to do a little bit of his vibe, I guess what you would call it, um, 
in the same thing, the same song you did, the Jacob Collier Challenge. Oh, and, um, yeah. So I want to get a Mateo reaction to yeah, my okay. solo. Okay, I'm willing to put myself out on the limb. And, um, and if you hate it, you can say it. Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> You can you can get like you know your your virtual tomatoes and be like <laughs> throw them at me. Okay, so let me do the screen share. I think I was smiling in my video because I thought that I was gonna take seven thousand takes to do this, and I was just like, here it goes. Here's number one or number three. I don't think it was too far from number one. So I am not a one take person. Um, yeah, me, me too. Don't worry. Oh. <laughs> Here's what it sounded like. It's really good. Oh, whoa. yeah, I, I really like the Eddie, Eddie Van Allen tapping at the end. Uh, that was a that was a good reaction. OK, so no tomatoes. I'm, I'm OK. Um, yeah, but, you, you catch the, the old world vibe, of course, with the legato. Yeah, I have also like I have tried to transcribe Holdsworth, but I was like, no way. I can't do this. My, first of all, my hands are they're they're thick, but they're average size. So doing any of the stretching yeah. is is like um, it's kind yeah, of yeah. If I have to, yeah. Sometimes uh, you need to use tapping for his stuff because your your left hand is not big enough for some of his leaks. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah, because I also have a very small hand, so I, I'm not very good with big stretch. Yeah, I know. No, your hand, your your fingers look long though. Are your fingers not long? Yeah. No, uh, I have a pretty small and this is not really long. Okay. You, you can un actually understand it on the fretboard. They are not very big. Okay, so you don't have a massive reach. But they work. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, they, I, I, I would say they do. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely work. But um, I, I think that that's a, a nice point that um, what you brought up and um, uh, that, that we were just talking about is that you can figure out um, stuff from, let's say, Guthrie or Allen, and they can serve as an inspiration. And, and they, you don't have to steal exactly what they're doing. Um, no. And I, I think regurgitate. There's, there's no need. You, uh, like, as I said, you need to capture the overall spirit of, of that solo or that section that you want to play, you know? This is yes. the essential part for me. Now, um, your solo um, on um, on Moonlight with um, it was Manuela um, Mont oh God Montesanti, right? Yes, Manuela Montesanti's Moonlight is really an incredible solo. It's really an incredible solo. Um, it's it, it's 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 soulful. It's of course all the technical stuff is is just lovely and that's one where i noticed um again your technique you know you just it, mm. it just seems like you have that so codified in and so internalized that you can produce really great sounding beautiful solos thank you yeah yeah of course uh, as i said it depends on the the stuff i want to play uh, I remember there is a leak that I can extrapolate from that solo. Uh, mm. uh, I think it's something similar. I can... Like, something like that. And... If, if I have to play something similar, like that with the yeah. rest stroke. Yeah, I can play it, but not at full speed. This is with the 
the classical stroke with a free stroke. So mm -hmm. if I have to do this kind of arpeggios, I always play with my right hand like that. Yes. If I have to play like, you know, close lines, I remember that I played something. Uh, this is basically a two five one using the. Uh, Uh, the diminished scale and um, so if i have to play like uh, you know the the classic beep up lines i always use th this technique so and did you um, just use it i i couldn't see because you went out of the um camera did you use your third finger for one moment on that or no yeah yeah I, I yeah 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 i always use this this one so Okay, so now, now, Matteo, can you do that, the same thing, relatively speaking, slowly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. If I have three notes on the same string, I use the ring finger, so. So this one is uh, uh huh. Um, I always use uh, like the, um, this. Yeah, it, you're almost doing uh, your 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 uh, pointer finger uh, um, pointer finger economy picking. <laughs> yeah, that's basically. Uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, economy picking stuff. So I always use, like, like for example, this pattern here. It's a mix of uh, uh, economy finger, <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, so it is almost, you are using like traditional rest stroke finger preparing, that, as they call it in classical, right? When you're preparing yeah, uh, your finger. Yeah, I think it's more like the bass technique rather than the classical technique. So, um, well, since you're since you are standing, <laughs> yeah. um, if you were to give, um, this will give you a chance to test out what it feels like to teach for just one second. If you were to give a beginner somebody a beginner in this technique, um, you know, a couple of things to work on. Like here, here's an intro to this. What should they do? Uh, I think they should start to, uh, you know, play the, the, the cliches, the most famous patterns. So like start with the... Uh... Right. Of course, it sounds boring if you play like that, so... I think you can apply some uh, strange stuff. Yeah. Sometimes um, if I have to play these groupings, it's a mix between the two and, uh, and also the ring finger. So really far down so we can see. Oh, wow. It's really a mess. I, I don't really know how I play it, but <laughs> it's so yeah. It's a it's it's a mix of the various techniques I talked about, and I think if you play a lot like that, it will it will become, of course, much easier because I sometimes I'm not really aware of the fingering I'm using. Mm. Because I'm I'm so much used to that, 
you know, the muscular memory does its work. Um, yeah. But of course, I, I don't play always like that. I, I prefer uh, a more uh, legato approach sometimes, because if you play like that always, the, the attack will be too aggressive sometimes. Yes. So it's a, you need to uh, spend a lot of time uh, trying to find, to find the right amount of legato and the right amount of picking, you know? Yes. And um, I think that you actually have, you don't, I know the last thing you want to imagine is that you have more school to do, but easily this is, your method, like when you actually sit down and break down everything you're doing, you easily have a master's thesis, if not um, a doctoral paper on, you know, your <laughs> technique. I'm serious. I'm serious. Nobody has done what you're doing and integrated so many different techniques into a pickless package, really, you know? So, yeah, if you want to sign up for some more school, <laughs> I'm sure you just can't wait. Would you say that you're a pretty daring guy? Like, you take chances? I actually meant that you personally do things that you take chances. I saw you jump off a cliff way yeah. down. Like, that's not something that every person will do. So do you think that in life... Um, aside from taking the big chance of playing some neo soul, do you think that that you're a person that you're a chance taker? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I can say that I took all the chances I had because nobody can <laughs> can took all the chances he he got. Uh, but of course, I'm sometimes too instinctive. I think. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, I mean, you you need to uh, enjoy life, you know. I don't want to think too much on my choices. I just let go everything. Uh, uh, and of course, yeah, you you need to took the right chances in order to, uh, of course, in order to have a successful career. I think. Uh, unfortunately, having talent is not enough in uh, yeah. our days, so you need also to have luck uh, and, and you need to work a lot, of course. Uh, talent is useless without hard work and, uh, and of course, the opposite. So, uh, yeah, taking chances is a really big part of the game. And you, so how are you with nervousness before playing in, at, a, at a show or a live gig? Do you feel that because you're a chance taker um, that you don't have, you don't really deal with nerves too badly? Like it doesn't affect your hands? Um, if, I, if I am with my trio, for example, I, I am really calm because we, we rehearsal a lot and we play, of course, uh, a lot of tunes that we play for a lot of time so I'm always calm if, if I have to play on another setting maybe you know for example the guitar duo setting I, all, mm. I sometimes play with my father uh, there I'm a little bit more nervous because I have more responsibilities because I have to comp I have to oh. um, you know I, I, am, I have more responsibilities because I also active uh, uh, an active part of the rhythm section if i am alone uh, so with my trio i'm you know calm enough um, if i have to play solo um, it's like a, a mix between being really calm and a little bit nervous sometimes because i i'm not I'm, i don't consider myself a, a good uh, a chord melody player so okay. that's kind of my weak point if i have to play solo um, but you know, I, I'm lucky enough to mm, always being uh, calm during these situations. Uh, I, I never had uh, the stage fright, you know. Your hands don't shake. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> now, tell me which famous guitarist said this about you. You are by far 
my favorite guitar discovery of 2019. Your next level good. <laughs> Who said that? That was Joe Bonamassa. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I can't really believe it because, uh, you know, Joe is uh, an excellent player. He's an amazing player. Yeah. We can say that it, it, it is, of course, a, a world-class player. And uh, uh, that really shocked me because... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, of course, I never. I, I'm not a really social media guy, you know. I only upload my stuff. I don't. I never upload my, you know, personal things. And I almost for, I, uh, I remember that uh, I almost forgot to answer to Joe <laughs> because I was so shocked that I I constantly thought uh, I constantly think. What I have, what I have to type, what I have to, what, uh, what can I answer to that? Because it, it was really a, a dream come true, you know. Uh, so that that was really a, a wonderful period for me because people started to, uh, you know, listen to my videos, and uh, I had a, a lot of. Uh, big numbers on social media uh, so that really helped me a lot to achieve a bigger audience i think i i know somebody else who is similar to you that you are very uh, that they're very private they don't put their yeah. life on social media they use social media to um to you know to show their skills and of course for survival we all we're all having to do that and it's not just yeah. COVID, it's that's this platform is really an, an amazing thing for musicians. And um, do you do you see yourself continuing down that road of being, you know, a, a private guy and only posting, just playing, or are you gonna are you gonna let people in on the all your all the fans <laughs> on like <laughs> What does Matteo like to eat with pizza and uh, <laughs> or drink? Excuse me. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, I my mindset. I think it's I I upload uh, only what people want to see, of course. Uh, that's kind of my point. People want to see me playing, so I just upload uh, uh, videos of me playing. Uh, I think that there's no need for more private videos, you know, because as I said, I'm not a big social media guy, so I use it uh, as a tool for, you know, um, have a bigger audience. Same thing for Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, so that's how I see, see it, yeah. And I also think that that's one of the reasons why you get a lot of stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> Some, yeah, sometimes I, I don't consider myself really productive uh, because I took a lot of time, especially on the composition side. Uh, but of course, sometimes I can, I can be really productive. Um, I, I don't have like uh, one video each day. I, I, I can't do that. I prefer quality over quantity, you know? Yes. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. Now, um, uh, there's a few things I want to talk about. Well, since we're talking about social media. Um, now, when I was back when I was your age, <laughs> when <laughs> I was your age, this whole thing of um, guitar tutorials and, and these, it was on video, they were coming out. And it was like the golden age of tutorials. Like your famous guys were actually speaking on a video with their guitar showing you how they were doing it. It was an incredible time. And we'd be looking at Guitar Player Magazine, wondering who the next person was going to be, whose instruction was gonna come out. Oh my God, Eric Johnson. What the, you know, Eric Johnson, <laughs> you know, and we're gonna learn it. And then and then the Alan Holders came, video came out and we were gonna learn not much. And then, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I, I understand that's a whole nother topic. Um, why Alan Holdsworth didn't just give everything that he's 
figured out a way in the video. I understand that. Um, but that is a really whole other topic. But there was um, there was that it was a golden age of tutorials. Like the guitar tutorial was really, uh, in my opinion, it was born, the video guitar tutorial. And now we have Instagram and the level of guitar playing is like it's it's way beyond through the roof it's beyond the the roof yeah. of a skyscraper and it's it sets the bar so high that almost you know if you see a guy with the guitar on instagram that you've never seen before it's shocking when they don't play fast it's shocking when they're not playing yeah. something that's <laughs> harmonic it's um it, it's like it's like almost the new thing is like um uh, to not have tattoos, <laughs> you know, but the new thing for guitar will be <laughs> not to be playing. I mean, what is your impression of all of this blistering shred mania that we're bombarded with these one minute vignettes of just shred mania? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, maybe it started to be too competitive, you know, of course, the level raised a lot. There are a, a lot of good players and uh, exceptional players also. But I think just because uh, we have all the tools, we have lessons, we have YouTube lessons, and uh, mm. we can slow down everything. We have a lot of advantages. So that's why the level is, is so high. And, um, and it will continue to raise, I think. Uh, we, we, I think we just mm, didn't reach the maximum potential of guitar. If yeah. there is a maximum potential, it's a, of course, it's a limitless instrument. And um, of course, I prefer the people that uh, there are uh, uh, right now very few people that have a personal uh, touch and a personal uh, music, you know. Like for example, uh, I uh, I can name uh, for example Pliny. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. about Pliny. He's not one of the best technical players around, of course, but he came up with his own touch and his own music. So I, I prefer the guys that uh, came up with something original rather than the guys that are exceptionally talented, uh, instrumentally speaking, like technically speaking, but they basically don't have a um, music of their own, you know? And uh, I, I think uh, there are some stuff that you can't teach. And um, you, uh, of course, you, you can't teach creativity. I think you, you can't teach uh, um, uh, how to write wonderful music that that's something and that's something you just uh, have i think uh but of course you can teach how to do the guthrie govan tapping yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can teach how to sound like allsworth if you have uh, um you, you know if you have a good predisposition predisposition for guitar uh well of course uh it, it uh, ultimately ultimately depends on uh, what music you will gonna share with the people. Um, so yeah, this is the era of uh, exceptionally talented people, uh, uh, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. But I I don't see a lot of uh, artists, you know, because th this is the real deal. I think this is the. Mm, the, the main focus you need you need to make music you you don't uh, you don't have to uh, uh, just make exercise and uh, you know prove that you can play guitar well, very well yeah and there's also the the intensity like for me um what i like to hear and what i like to try to to express is it like there in a, in a musical intensity like some kind of i know it sounds so cliche and you don't have to play fast to do it but sometimes it's cool when you when you can do it um yeah. and that is the 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 
the passion i hate to say that that word like you know to be a passionate player and to have that come true people feel that and then of course there's everything else that that builds and buffets that like a great melodic sense um yeah uh one of the things that i hear in, in modern fusion i don't know i don't know what else yeah. to call it but is a bizarre use of chromatic notes you know like when you listen to jazz and you you know like if, if you're going to want if you want to learn chromatics, you go to check out jazz guys because yeah. it's pretty safe to say that Brecker, McCoy Tyner, Steve Grossman, Dave Liebman, they know how to use chromatics, you know? Yeah. Uh, this sometimes it's almost like a upside down way of using it that to me, it doesn't sound, it sounds like it's almost wrong. Have you, yeah, have, do you it, know what it, I mean? It sounds, it sounds too guitaristic sometimes too much like an exercise. You know, some, some people, when they think about chromatic playing, they, they think about the... Of course, that, that's not chromatic play, that's just the chromatic yeah. scale. I think there are some rules to follow, like, you know, target notes, passing notes. And I think you need to learn that from the great jazz players, not, not only guitar players, so you can learn yeah. it from uh, horn players, for example. Uh, like, for example, of course, Coltrane, Parker, Chet Becker, also very melodic player. And uh, also, yeah, Brecker, but Brecker was more on the, you know, sometimes on the uh, atonal side, like, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's like the, the next step, but you need to mm, get the fundamentals right before yes. all the uh, outside stuff, you know. Um, if you get the fundamentals right, it will be much easier to incorporate the, uh, the chromatic passages on your playing. And I took a lot of things from, uh, you know, Pat Martino, Joe Pass, and uh, I, I like to I like to play uh, you know hard bop stuff, and I always play it on my lines, even if I play on distortion, you know. I did something like that, uh, like like the Pat Martino. Um, it's nice to hear those lines swung. You know, like he plays a swing that's very that's very linear. Yeah, that's kind and, of uh, uh, yeah the the sixteenth feel and of course the swing feel. You, you need to swing in order to play jazz, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I took a lot of lines from uh, uh, various jazz players and and I applied it on my Brock vocabulary basically. Yeah, it sounds great. And, and you know, it's something that you mentioned. I ha actually have it sitting right here. Uh, this is a, I guess this, this would be a plug for Vidami, but this hands-free YouTube thing where you can learn. I mean, you could slow, slow YouTube stuff down and it's hands-free. You don't ever have to take your hands off the guitar. Huh. It's, it's yeah, amazing. That's, that's really useful. Yeah, this Vidami pedal. Um, uh, when you were talking about we have all the tools, and I was thinking this tool is a great tool. There's, um, of course, Transcribe, amazing slow downer. Um, so those people mm -hmm. who are trying to figure out what you're doing, you know, now all your secrets are exposed. <laughs> you can use the pedal or, um, I mean, the software. I was using amazing slow downer for since version one. <laughs> that quote you did of the Rosanna solo in, um, oh. and, and Alex is, and Alex, um, Stornello's footprints was that his his version of footprints? Yeah, yeah, it was a strange version of footprints. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was that was good. I was like, I know that one. I know that. that was a great quote. I've never heard anybody quote that song um, in that tune or actually ever. So that that was really <laughs> that was really creative. So you guys should check that out. It's on Instagram on on Mateo's Instagram now. Matteo, before we like go into the next day with me just, you know, chatting with you. Um, so you want me to tell people do not contact you for lessons? Uh, or... For now, I think. Okay. Um, because I, 
I will do lessons in the future, I think. But I, as I said, I'm, I don't consider myself prepared enough for be a good teacher. So okay. um, that's why I mm, want to finish my album first, want to concentrate more on the music, and then maybe I will uh, start to, uh, like, you know, do Skype lessons and all that stuff. Oh, well, wait a second. Your album, we <laughs> hold the bus. Your album, what? Tell us about your album. When is that going to come out? Um, I hope for this summer. I, I think I will be, I, I will have everything ready for the summer. Uh, I, I, I have a few songs ready. Uh, I just recorded some demos with my trio. And uh, it, it will be a eight uh, original album with two covers. I'm planning to do Love this. It. So, um, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm currently writing new songs. So it's all work in progress. And I, I hope I will find the inspiration to finish this album. <laughs> because right now I have five songs ready. Uh, so I have to work on three more songs and basically I finished. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I hope it will be interesting for many guitar people here. Yeah. Yes, I think it will be. I think um, you're going to sell a bunch of them and you probably get so. people contacting you for tabs, right? I imagine yeah. people are saying, yeah, <laughs> I, I noticed how you close your eyes like that. I was talking with Thomas Griggs and I said, the, the way I met Thomas was um, uh, Camilo Valendia, the guitarist, great guitarist from Miami, told me about him. And the first thing I saw on his page was, of course, the video of him. And then, hey, bro, you got tabs? And then, I, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I had to write something smart underneath it. Like, uh, yeah, why don't you pay for the tabs or write the tabs out yourself, you know? Um, so <laughs> when people contact you for tabs, um, I imagine that you don't have the tabs. No, no. Uh, th there are some transcriptions of my solos on YouTube, um, but uh, I don't usually transcribe my own solos. Uh, yeah. uh, so there are other, other people that um, make that, like uh, Livy Clive, for example. It's a really good transcriber, and mm -hmm. he will transcribe the, uh, some of my solos. Uh, so if you are interested in tabs or like material like that, you should cho you should check the Levy Clay's YouTube channel. Okay. Um, yeah, he has a lot of material. I don't have tabs, so uh, oh, yeah, yeah, notation so or tabs, uh, it's, it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> One thing that you can look forward to when you become a teacher is not only transcribing your own solos, but entering every one of your... <laughs> Your pick techniques, yes, yep. Yeah, welcome I, to the land of pedagogy. <laughs> yeah, I know that I need to do it also for myself because uh, I think I will have a a, cle a clear idea of my technique after I I've done all this work. Yes, and it's going to be brilliant. I know it's going to be brilliant. I mean, you can make a, a very unique curriculum. And, it, and it's part of your legacy, actually. You don't, you might not see it now, but I think you've really, um, I think you really have brought something to electric guitar playing that was not there prior. And I think it's really brilliant. Um, Thank you. And I think that that's like a, a really great place to end, even though I could talk with you some more. Oh, wait, one question. Can you please, please set the record straight, especially for the Americans listening? Does pineapple belong on pizza? No, absolutely not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> okay, so you've heard it there, and this is a great place to end. So, Matteo, thanks a million. It was great to have Hello. you. And um, you. hey, we'll keep in touch. <laughs>